So I'm reading a lot and going to class every Saturday with Dr. Craig Carr. And uh, it's what I, if, if this was class when I was in school, I probably would have stayed. I would never would have left school. I just, it just, it Same. is so fulfilling. But what I'm learning is how to think and how to broaden my perspective. You know, I was raised in the era where there was Booker T versus WEB. And, you know, for a lot right. of my, my growing up, I'm part of Talented Tenth. And then I grew to appreciate, you know, through talking with my dad, actually, about this whole building from within, you know, because he was, you know, low key militant, even though publicly he, he presented himself very, very well. And there's something about that. Right. Um, as I'm reading, Booker T, I think, was crafty from this standpoint that he knew white people. <laughs> he knew them up close and he knew that while we we're out there fighting for rights, the rights they would never give us, they would kill us first. And it's, and, and it's you, you think about Tuskegee, which is still in existence to this day. You think about him being in the middle of Lynchtown, and they didn't touch him. And some would say it's because he was sellout, and, you know, he was Uncle Tom. But I, as I watched him, he gave a whole platform for George Washington Carver to com come up with everything. He had an, a name, profound love of black people, but he also understood the depravity of whiteness. Right. And to protect right. that, he had to walk a tightrope. Now, he had a little misogyny built in and a whole host of other things that I'm imagining were just ingrained in him as a person born in bondage. But there was something really genius about what he understood. Yeah. And so, you know, as I watch this play out today, you know, if, if many of us had devoted ourselves to our own community, built our own Tuskegee's, so to speak, where you can eat, you can think, you can grow, you can build, you can invent in your own pocket. We have control over our mayors, control over our police forces because it's our own, you know, earth seed, so to speak. But they were everywhere, not in just one space. I think I think it would be a little bit different right now. I mean, I think you're right. And, you know, when we talk about trying to have uh, the honest conversations and the covert conversations and recognizing that you have to be able to do both. And recognizing that, as we said before, there are some conversations we cannot have on these airwaves, right? Um, I think we have, to, we have to be clear that when you are living in hostile territory, that you have to engage in an above-the-board or uh, above-ground life and a below-ground life. And I think all of our most successful leaders have recognized that. Um, and they had the tools. Some of them had access to more tools than others in order to be able to do that. We had that on the plantation. A lot of the en enslaved Africans who came over here understood and already had secret societies built into their social framework. They retained a lot of that during the plantation. We talk about, you know, running off to the woods to sing songs and spiritual we weren't always just running out to the woods to sing songs and spirituals. A lot of that running out to the woods was to transfer information, was to transfer knowledge from one generation to the other so that the, the, the role that the secret societies played would be able to be maintained. And I think, you know, now that we're in this environment uh, where our culture tells us to share everything, we, we do something good, we want to put it on Facebook or tweet about it or put it out on Instagram selfie of me, you know, leading the revolution, like with a selfie picture. And so I think that we have to contend with what we know historically has been in our best interest and what we now have to battle with as it pertains to the culture that's driving some of the actions that we have now. And so I was, you know, I was telling you on the break that I've been privileged to work with an organization uh, from the time I was in college that I helped to create um, where we have uh, a lot of public events and we do a lot of things in public, but then we have our private Sankofa circles where only people of African descent can come. And if you are not of African descent, you can't come. You can't be in the room. The same way if um, we are having a, you know, a woman's initiative and you are not a woman identified person, you can't be in that initiative conversation. The same way if I am not a part of the Korean secret society, but I want to, I can't be in their meetings. They got to, and you know what? I don't even know when their meetings is happening. Why? I'm not Korean. They, I'm not their target audience. So we have to be comfortable with maintaining two halves of ourselves. And we know that, you know, that we wear the mask. We, we, we know how to be dualistic because we live that every day. But we have to remind ourselves of the stories like what you were talking about earlier about the importance of having, yes, our public persona and, yes, our public activities. But there has to be a private space. There has to be private time where only those of us with whom 
we have been able to accrue some wins, right? Like if I don't know you, and even if you, you know, you've seen it typically my sister, if we ain't ever struggled together and won nothing together, I can't trust you but so far. And as you said before, if you can't trust somebody with the handshake, you ain't going to get trusted with the keys to the kingdom. It's no one knows what, that, what we're talking about right now because that was an off-mic conversation. That was a secret society <laughs> conversation. We just had a secret society conversation off-mic that you just brought onto the mic, and now everybody know <laughs> that we were talking about it. All right. See, uh, that would not be a good look if we was really planning something. That right. would be a bad look. Now That'd they would know. Look. All right. Uh, there was a society called Poro. Are you familiar with Poro? I'm not familiar with Poro. All right. I just dropped a breadcrumb. Y'all can go ahead and uh, find out what that is. P-O-R-O. Annie Turnbull Malone actually named her company that. That's how mm. genius she was. This is why, you know, when, when you watch the Madam C.J. Walker thing that they had on Netflix, y'all didn't even do your work. Because Annie Turnbull, not only did she develop a way to be wealthy in a culture as a black woman where she was absolutely last in everything, but became a millionaire first, made other black women empowered to be millionaires, including Sarah Breedlove, a.k.a. Madam C.J. Walker. But part of her mission was about empower. So to, to denigrate her in that space, to, to be a, a, a you know a half half black woman who was caught up in in physical appearances in that uh, Netflix self self uh, self made was an abomination on so many levels because I just yeah. Dr. Great Carr dropped that on me on Saturday off mm. Poro mm. was what Annie Malone named her company and if you look up mm. Poro it was a black and African secret society that came over from Africa that you were just talking so I'm like so she wasn't just selling hair care. Right. Which is what happens frequently. People get a little bit, a piece of something, they run with it, but they don't, they don't have the foundation. They don't know what the bread was baked in. And I feel like even being on these airwaves, half the things that I say, people don't even, you know, and I remember the first week I'm on the air and I'm trying to dog whistle. Don't, don't whistle at me. I ain't no dog. And I'm like, people, <laughs> how, how do we get from here to there? If you don't have the, the wherewithal to hear the message and the message and the message. To right. even get to, oh, you a sellout. Really? Really? What in my background has ever demonstrated that? Again, tree and fruit. And yet we'll eat poison fruit every single day until it, well, until it makes us sick. Because slaves don't think, we just do. And yes, I'm saying we have a slave mentality because, frankly, we do. We never got therapy after the enslavement of our people. We never were able to process. You know, if you're an alcoholic, at least you got Alcoholics Anonymous. It's going to help you. For the rest of your life, you are considered an alcoholic. So you have your 12 steps. You work your 12 steps. You have a partner, a sponsor, who for your entire life is going to help you recognizing that your addiction to alcohol is a lifelong thing. I have often described um, my relationship to white supremacy is I'm a white, I'm a recovering black white supremacist. I am in recovery from being addicted, forcibly addicted to the drug of white supremacy. And so the same way that we had to create uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, the same way you create um, um, Narcotics Anonymous, and you have the, the section for the family members, you have the section for the person who's actually addicted. We have to create structures that will, one, treat our symptoms and the reality that we are still suffering from internalized white supremacy, because when we had the opportunity to create secret societies post-slavery, um, we first wanted access to white people's secret societies. Then we got the ability to create our own secret societies, and they quickly devolved into the social clubs that we now know them to be. So even when we had the, opportun even when we had the opportunity to create those spaces, it is often now used for feeding the egos that were created through the process of being enslaved and finding liberation here in this space. So I feel like we have to create moments. We have to create systems that are going to, one, address the sickness that we still have. Because, you know, as I've heard someone say recently, you know, I, I see that you're so frustrated about what's happening with all the police killings. But how many black people did other black people kill in those same cities? And I don't ever see any protests about that. And we know that that's often a red herring and people use that to take us off the, the mat, the, the point of looking at police brutality. And we understand that. But the reality is. We don't often have protests that are effectively going to address our inability to see our own humanity in each other. So while we're talking about trying to create secret societies and safe spaces for us to coexist in this space, we got to create the systems that are going to help us to process through the internalized white supremacy that is still driving a lot of the decision making that we have within our own communities. Can we eliminate uh, the, the term white supremacy? 
What do you want to replace it with? I'm happy to. White welfare. Mm. White white mediocrity. White yeah. Because in in putting those two words together, you are you are affirming something. Mm. You are saying that you're supreme. White mm. supremacy. So you, you're you're not recovering from white supremacy. You're recovering from from a white fallacy or white white mythology or you you know what I'm saying like. I, th- I this hear you. Is, this, these are the these are the birth the birthings of like because language words are powerful. In the beginning was the word word became flesh. When we put those two words together, it it indoctrinates you into this notion that that is due north. That is the standard. That is, it's made up. It's made up construct. Yeah. It's made up power power tool. It's a made up power tool. We fought into it. We use it all the time. White black blah 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 blah. As long as there's white black is always going to be something dirty, dusty, whatever. Malcolm went through that in the Bible. I mean, not in the Bible, the, the dictionary, which became his Bible in, 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 in prison. But yeah, that, those things, you know, are things we pass on to our kids. Yeah. You know, even, even I, was, I was talking about, I just started watching Westworld because I'm running out of things to watch. And, uh, <laughs> and it, it is a virtual world. But in this virtual world, you know, it's, it's this Western thing. The guy gets dressed in his Western garb and, and the lady says, you have two choices. Here's your final two choices. On one side, there's a wall of hats, black, wall of hats, white. What have you been conditioned to believe the white hat is? What's mm. the white hat? The person that wears the white hat is what? You know, and, and those are just childhood conditionings, right? Right. Wash you whiter than snow. Angels are white. Everything that we, so, so now you, you, you say white, I'm, I'm indoctrinated into white supremacy, whiteness doesn't exist so so how so what, what it do we exist so long as we believe that it does yes and just like money money is a social construct it, doesn't it is really exist. and a trust construct right and yet if we don't have it our lives are materially altered and so i'm happy to change the phrase so long as we can deal with the fact that we have been indoctrinated and part of our epigenetic transfer and legacy has been the centering of whiteness so as I, I think I was saying, um, you know, at our Sankofa circles, white people can't come. And the reason we had to do that was because we recognized that in this therapeutic space of healing for black people, as soon as one white person walks in, even if they're an ally, even if they're someone who has pro- proved that they are down for the cause, we are so indoctrinated with centering and valuing them that we will stop speaking as honestly about the pain we are experiencing because we don't want to make them uncomfortable. What is that related to? It's related to back. And a couple hundred years ago, if you could not make white people feel comfortable, you did not have access to a skill set that would allow you longevity in this world. Today, on the job, if you do not know how to make white people feel comfortable, that is a skill set that can quickly have you exited from your company. So we have to, whatever we want to call it, let's call it that, so long as we're able to deal with the reality that part of our epigenetic inheritance has been to value them so much that the very idea of separating from them to preserve our own life makes a lot of us too uncomfortable to even have that conversation. So let's have it. 866-801-8255. I'm here for it. Laurie Daniel Favors, Afro State of Mind is in the building. Uh, let's see. Where should we go? Where should we go? Where should we go? Where should we go? Leslie in Alabama, you're on. Welcome to the Karen Hunter Show. Hey, Leslie. Hey, Karen. I just wanted to encourage you because my heart is heavy as you as well. And when my heart gets heavy, my grandma and my mom used to tell me this scripture. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. And basically what I'm telling you, honey, is that the rock that we need to be led to is more education, more intelligence, more self-awareness. And basically I think that as far as leaving or staying, I'm staying because my ancestors helped build this this little place, and I and I know my way around, and I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere because okay. this is my home. This yeah. is my home until it's not. Until it's a police and, and, state. Until it's not. You know. And I listen. I respect that. I I've, I've parroted those exact same words, Leslie. And I thank you for calling. I said the exact same thing. Five generations. I've been in five generations. You know, the blood is in the soil. Mm. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah, all of that. And I feel like, because land doesn't, you know, 
even the mythology about Native Americans being childlike and silly, you know, cowries, they, 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 you know, they sold Manhattan for a bag of beads. But no one asked the question, how valuable were beads back then? How mm. valuable were cowrie shells? How valuable was salt? Salt was, the most, was more valuable than gold. And today mm. we look down, oh, how childish, how, how unsophisticated, how stupid people were to trade. Because that's all money is, right? I, I think we have to reframe a lot of things in, in the way in which we think. Land, land ownership was nothing to Native Americans, to Africans. There were no boundaries, as you just mentioned. Those lines were drawn in a conference had in Germany or in, in Great Britain. All the leaders sat around and determined they divvied up the continent of Africa, they divvied up the new world, and they put boundaries and they put fences and walls. And that, that's, not, that's not a Native people's perspective of life. That's, I'm, I'm saying we're going to have to rethink a whole lot of things. Are we capable of doing it? And if, if we are to move someplace... You know, what does that place look like? You know, because we still bring and, some of us, Caleb. Caleb, are, are we? And what would it look like if we had no definitive place to go? What if we were the next nomad, nomadic people, right? Because when I hear, uh, and I respect the idea that I, you know, I, I, my people built this land. I respect that notion. But if your people built uh, a city on the edge of the water, and the sand is eroding from the edge of the water. I mean, you can fight to stay there, but you're going to be buried in the ocean. So we just got to be clear <laughs> when we say that. And what that means is this is what we get. We get right. Breonna Taylor. We get George Floyd. We get Ahmed Arbery. So, I mean, we can say that, but that means that this is the best it's ever been. And I don't know that a lot of us, when we think of it that way, are willing to tolerate this as the best it can possibly be. So if I were to be a part of a group of people who were sort of the new nomad, right, a, a, a nationless people, not by our own doing, but baby, here we are, I would want to start asking myself, well, what, has, what elements do successful nomadic people have to create or embrace in order to be successful, no matter where they go? You know, I often hear people say, well, I'm moving back to XYZ country in Africa. Okay, well, have you ever been there? Have you ever, do you have any relationships there? Have you cultivated any international trade there? What are you doing to, to, to develop the, because you know, if somebody brand new moves into my space, I, who are your people? Where you come from? You just showing up. So we have to be able to have honest conversation and then recognize that as being Americanized, a lot of us don't do well in non-American spaces. That's I did not grow up necessarily in this country. I've always seen Americans as a very interesting, we're an interesting creation. So I, I am an American, um, but it's interesting to see Americans who've never left the country leave for the first time and go into spaces that are not similarly westernized. What are, what are you doing right now to prepare for that? Can you camp? Can you deal without having access to the luxuries that we have been taught that we are deserving of here, recognizing that even here we don't really have access to as many of them as we thought we did? Mm. Well, I know we need to have a system of currency or some sort of economic power. I'm just going to put that out there. If you're going to move nomadically, you're going to have to have some, some, some transferable currency no matter where you go. Uh, let's go to Robert in New Jersey. Some of us can't even get our credit together. Uh, hey, How you Robert. Doing? I'm good. How you doing? <laughs> good, good, First good. time caller. Uh, when, I, <laughs> when I found this channel, I was, like, truly amazed with all the shows I hear. But let me let me just say this in regards to the police situation until we call it for what it is we're never going to get any change that's the biggest gang that exists in america is the police department they ride together and they're going to die together no matter what their skin color is their color is blue and until in this country you if you take a life you must be judged for it, it irregardless to who you are 24 years ago, I owned a grocery store in Plainfield. 24 years ago, guy tried to rob my store. I shot him. Jersey has no self-defense law. I didn't shoot to kill. I still had to stand trial and still went to jail. Mm. How are the police, how is a policeman's life any different than my life? You shoot somebody? You kill somebody and they ain't got no gun, no weapon of any sort. You deserve to be judged. 
I agree. I agree. Mm. And I think that's the greatest frustration too, because we, we I, I tweeted out and bless you, brother, a uh, man after my own soul, having a, a grocery store in Jersey reminds me of, of my dad. Um, and one of my dad's best friends who they got into the grocery store business together. Um, Richie Ringo, I never forget, had a grocery store. A person came to rob him and uh, he chased after him and, and he didn't know that the guy had a guy with him and shot him in the back and he died. Mm. Um, and it, and it, it shook my dad, you know, because they, they were they were brothers that both had grocery stores, Richie Ringo in East Orange, my dad in Newark. And, you know, having that community around buying things together and setting up things together and, you know, the support. To, to have your life taken like that. So I, I, I recognize the, the danger that you were in and still had to go to jail. That's crazy. I think that's the problem, Laurie, as a lawyer, as a person that sits in a, at a center for social justice to see Darren Wilson go home and Betty Shelby go home and Pantaleo go home and, and all these people who have taken lives, we've witnessed them take lives. Hell, the guy that shot Walter Scott in the back had a hung jury. He was almost going to go home because a jury of his peers could not see him as somebody that is worthy of jail. That's right. crazy in America, right. this land right. of laws. So how do we reconcile with that? Robert's on to something. Cause I think that that's the, the if, if, if every time this happens, somebody paid for it, a, I think it would stop happening. I think it would stop happening, but I think these cops, they look around and go, I can get away with this. I could shoot someone Absolutely. on fifth Avenue. I could shoot someone on fifth Avenue and get away with it. I think they know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. They do know that. And the reality is it's true. And the answer to the question as to how is a cop what life worth more than ours, because the cop is a part of the armed weaponry of the state, which has determined black people's lives are only good enough so long as they can profit from and vis-a-vis slavery or other types of conditions. So the answer is the same. I sit at the Center for Law and Social Justice, and I've always said one of the most difficult parts of my job is when we provide legal consultations and someone comes in who is justifiably upset, angry, bitterly uh, uh, enraged because of some social or racial injustice that they have experienced. One of the most difficult parts of my job is to hear their story, look them in the eye and tell them, you're absolutely correct. This was a complete violation of your humanity, and yet there is nothing that the law will be able to do for you in this instance. And it happens far too often because the reality is when you are a part of, when you are seeking redress from a system that was created by the ones who enslaved you, you are literally going to the house of justice, which is administered by your former slave master, seeking to hold current slave uh, murderers accountable. It is an insane expectation. And yet we struggle, yet we fight, yet we go to court. I have colleagues at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund who right now are defending lawsuits that they won 30, 40, 50 years ago that they still have to defend. 30 decades upon decades of fighting one or two specific legal issues about this school uh, district trying to be discriminatory or that housing uh, area discriminated against black people. And we can continue to fight. I'm not suggesting that we don't. We just have to be clear that we are literally, you know you are enslaved when you got to ask the people who enslaved you to administer a system of justice against those who are currently perpetuating harm against you. We have to be willing to sit with that long enough to realize what the natural progressing out progressive outcome of this all is. Could Thurgood Marshall have done something? 866-801-8255. Johnny Cochran, if he were still alive, would we be going through? I don't know. Uh, I was going to go back to you, Robert. What? I I told this lady, uh, she said, well, we just need to, you, she said, y'all just, you lawyers just got to use your words better. You just got to come up with better legislation. I said, ma'am, Jesus Christ, the King himself, to come down from the throne up above. Pen the most, I mean, the whole Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So what they tell us is they could inspire the legislation written at the hands of the angels. It still has to be interpreted through a judge who's been trained through a white supremacist viewpoint of the world. It still has to be subjected to a system that was intentionally and specifically designed to benefit white people at the expense of everyone else. That is at the fundamental heart of the entire battle that we're having right now. All right, Robert, uh, new caller. I appreciate you. You get the last word. Uh, Your your guest today 
is dead on the money. We're trying our best to exist within a structure that does not value us or see us as equal or human, at least. That that's the biggest that's the biggest issue right there, and she's she's been dead on on the nose ever since she began speaking. Well, um, let me say she's here every week, so there's that. Uh, Laurie Daniel Favors is my Wednesday partner in power, Center for Law and Social Justice, Afro State of Mind. She's been here rocking with us for the last couple of years. She also has a show on Sunday, so you can get more of this with specific knowledge. Uh, Sunday Civics with L. Joy Williams right here. What time is that? Ten o'clock? Ten a.m. Eastern? O'clock. All right, Barbara, Eastern. so so now you got the weekend covered as well. Welcome to the call-in family. Do not be a stranger. Let's head over to Byron in Cali. Hey, Byron. Hey, oh. Karen, it's Gyron. Oh, Gyron. All right, welcome. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to make a comment. I, you were talking earlier to a caller who said he was a supervisor, police supervisor in uh, – North Carolina, I believe, and he was talking about uh, getting these officers decertified for, uh, you know, murdering people on the streets. I believe that's one. That's I believe that's one part of a solution. But he, he, here's my background. I'm 63 years old. I'm a black man, obviously, and uh, I'm retired law enforcement. I've worked for city, municipal agencies, state agencies and for a time for the federal government in law enforcement. Where are you and, right uh, now? You sound like you're not uh, physical distancing. Oh, I am. Actually, I'm under an awning at the car wash. Today's the first day the car wash is over, so I had to get my car washed. Did you really? <laughs> I did. I did. I needed my oil changed and my car washed. Okay. All right. Carry on. I, I'm trying so hard not to judge, Lori. This is the toughest... It is so tough. I mean, my goodness. All right, go ahead, Guy Ron. Hold on. Hold on to glory. Hold on to glory, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But he, how about now? Can you hear me better? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Here's, my story nope. is. Nope, it got I've worse. I've been. Uh... All right, call back when you finish washing your car. We'll take you because um, I, I don't really have the patience to go through that, Guy Ron. Call us back. Uh, Kendra, North Carolina, welcome. Hi, Karen. I'm a hey. first-time caller, and I just want to Yay! thank you for this platform. <laughs> this platform, I learned so much. Um, the information dissemination is just invaluable. Um, I feel your pain, your anger um, with with George Floyd and the numerous others, but to me it just seems like it's hunting season. And it seems like every year when the weather gets warm, you know, the the killings start. And I feel like this this agenda we already know has been validated by the FBI, but I feel like it's now starting to become normalized. They want us to see this as as normalizing and it's conditioning, right? It's it's conditioning our mindset because we see this every day. You know, it's it's part of the news cycle. And I just think this agenda is so much bigger, you know, than the police. And I think that their way of weaponizing is through these institutions. And we have this validation already. And so, you know, when we always ask, what are we going to do about it? I think that we don't understand the power of collectivism. And I know you talk about this all the time on your show. And we have to start thinking about how we're going to weaponize. And we have to start thinking about, you know, these these white people. mediocritist, right? They organize and sell. So they have little small pockets all throughout the country that is creating this agenda. Absolutely. And with, with us, we need to do the same thing. We need to start in, instead of trying to set this big, large agenda for, for our community, because we know that we're diverse within our culture in many different ways. But we got to start thinking more strategically. And we, we have to, I think, target this in three ways through political representation, right, which you talk about all the time. And not just voting, but establishing PACs, right? You know, how did the LGBT community move their agenda? Through PACs, political yes. action committees, right? Yes. So all of our celebrities that want to speak on these issues and not usually prolifically, you know, and not <laughs> with a lot of knowledge, 
you know, okay, let's have them be the face, right? They can go to the congressional hearings. They can testify. They can, you know, get their shared experience. But when it comes to the knowledge, and, but the, let's use those faces, throw your money at the problem, right? Because in order to establish the PACs, in order to drive influence, there always has to be money behind it. So we want you, we want the representation, we want your celebrity status, but in order to shift, in order to move, in order to dismantle this stuff, because I don't really see how we're going to drive change unless we dismantle, like, you know, the reset, these archaic, you know, structures that are never going to benefit us. And I think that we have to look within and we have to redirect our energy to create change within instead of expecting them to change. Because that's one thing I know for certain they're not going to because okay. they're scared now. Right. Okay. We, I want to try to get as many people in. So one political representation. What's number two? Collectivism and education. We got to retool. OK. Education. What's number three? Entrepreneurship. OK. You know, I, and, listen. And within our own communities. Black. Fortune. One, two, three. Kendra, this is. First of all, spot on, I 100% agree. <laughs> um, and and as, as you're talking, I'm thinking, Larie made a, a reference to some things, right? So we have Masonic orders. We have uh, all kinds of fraternities that have Greek names and symbols and uh, sororities. What if, what if, what if the cap is, who, 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 Martin Luther King was in the alphas, right? He was an alpha. What if the alphas devoted themselves to creating an educational platform? And what if the Kappas, the Dapa Kappas, uh, what if they were the ones that, that were the political leaders because they're very charming, right? And, and within the Kappas, you raised up the political arm, right? The political p- leaders. Um, the, the Qs, my daddy's uh, frat. What if they were the, the, the um, military arm, so to speak, or the folks that went into the police force where you got your training? So if you wanted to be a cop, you became a Q. They would train together, brotherhoods. Y'all got organizations all over the country, all over the world. And this would be the, the, the arm that we would send into the police force. You would learn that. Urban League, training you to, to integrate tough spaces to make sure that we are, we are getting justice and, and every organization would have their individual thing that they had to do. And then we would check them every year to make sure instead of them releasing a report on the state of black America, we will release a report on what you have and have not done based on a checklist of things that you've been required to do. All of you celebrities with all this money, cause they let you in because they knew you weren't going to do anything. How about you flip the script? celebrities and athletes and instead of flapping your gums and telling people you're not going to vote and no no agenda no vote even though you don't even have an agenda yourself how about you put money into a pack <laughs> clay clay laid them out yesterday larry i don't know if you heard his show but oh my god i was sitting I there i couldn't even so i couldn't even get ready for my own show because i was like oh wait shoot it's three o'clock the hell <laughs> i was like clay stop it but yeah we we have every we have the structure the infrastructure we have the, the manpower. We can, we can throw the meanest party. Don't, don't let there be a freak, Nick. Boy, we know how to show up for some things. We know how to line dance. We know how to, oh, do scholarship dinners, but it's just really social gatherings. Why not weaponize the organizations we already have with each of them? Because y'all work together anyway in your conclaves. Come together and actually, and maybe the Masons could be the secret places. Y'all could actually create a real secret. Ah, <laughs> oh, I... I shouldn't be talking this out loud, but these are the things I would like to see done. This is just hypothetical. This is hypothetical. hypothetical. Thank this you. This is hypothetical. Hypothetical. Because if anybody's hearing me, though. <laughs> I, I, I don't know either. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but, so it's just you and me talking hypothetically just, yes, out loud. Yes. Um, because we do have organizations. You see, I got my pencil and my notes. I'm, yeah. I'm writing. We do have organizations that have mastered at least the entry component of how you would get access to secret spaces. So we've got plenty of information out there, some known, some unknown, about what you would need to do if you wanted to join a particular organization. And yet, I think within the organization, I would ask some questions, like because she mentioned something, the caller mentioned something about small cells, small groups of people. And that language is a little political, but it's just us talking Small gatherings. Let's just call it gathering. So we, we you know, the, the folks who's listening, um, who ain't supposed to be listening, get a little, they, they stay calm down. We had small gatherings of people, local groups, because one of the things we talked about on Sunday Civics was the fact that politics is local. 
And it's why a lot of times people get into politics and they want to focus on the presidential. Don't focus on the presidential. Focus on your city council. What's happening right here, right now? Who is the sheriff? Who's appointing the sheriff? Focus on that. But if you are having these small gatherings of people, I would want to know what do the education protocols look like? What does the study look like? You know, Karen, you and Dr. Carr have been gathering on a weekly basis. Um, what's, the, what's the curriculum for looking at how we have done things in the past? We should all now know what the Poro is. You just dropped that, and I Googled it real quickly. I, I got a couple of sites. I'm going to go and peruse. But what's the education protocols look like? How much information can you get access to if you have not done any of the study? How do we evaluate? What tests do we use to evaluate what study you have engaged in? There are some organizations, I'm told, hypothetically, of course, that if you did not understand, if you could not participate in the first six weeks of education, that was all you could do was pass out sandwiches at the lunch line. That was it. You couldn't be involved in deciding who made the sandwiches. You couldn't decide what was going to be in the sandwiches. You couldn't just find out where we got the ingredients from to, come, to make the sandwiches. You couldn't know nothing else because you could not master the first six weeks of study. Once you master the first six weeks of study, you too can get off the sandwich distribution line. Now you have decision-making power about what's going to be inside the sandwich. And then I would want to ask, what could hypothetical infiltration look like? Just hypothetically. What would it look like to have an active community project of a small nature, because we're just testing some things out, what could infiltration look like? And, well, we might not know what it looks like right now. We could certainly study what infiltration looked like in the past. We've got these examples. These are things that we could look at. I would want to ask these small gatherings of people, what's your plan for addressing our addiction to white nationalism? We're going to take supremacy out of it. I'm just making white nationalism right now. What is your plan, your 12-step plan, to help those of us who are addicted to white nationalism or addicted to the aspiration of proximity to whiteness. And I got my children yelling in the next room, Lord Jesus. That's all right. What That's is the right. plan? That's life. What would be the, the, <laughs> That's legacy. What would be the plan for ferreting out or, or putting your local group of people on a pathway towards eradicating that internalized white nationalism? What would be your plan for addressing ego battles? We've seen how ego battles, you know, ego between the boys and Booker T. Washington and Garvey. We saw how all those things worked together and how they destroyed what could have been a triad of greatness and made it, you know, factious groups of people. How are we cultivating humility among a people who have been taught via our culture to pride being the king on top? These are just some questions I would ask. I would ask that every small gathering, just hypothetically, I would just suggest that small gatherings of people think about those things strategically. Well, what Africans have done, Africans can do. And Martin Luther King was selected. Ella Baker, the, the, the groundwork was done. Bayard Rustin, Ella Baker, um, the Pullman car guy, they are the ones that did the organization. Martin Luther King, they handpicked him because of his, or again, it's like what is, we, we deified him, but he was selected because of his ability to be a great orator, to push and deliver the message. Sometimes everyone, like I know I can't deliver everything. I got this show here, but there are things that I'm working on that I can't deliver. Somebody else gonna have to do it, hypothetically. Because, you know, my, my style is not, you know, it's kind of wild sometimes. 866-801-8255. And, and those secrets, I, I mentioned Poro because our churches were once that place where we could organize and gather. The churches were the ones that were doing credit unions, helping to, to start insurance companies when we couldn't get insurance. The churches were those ground, listen, even Martin Luther King, the churches were the places of organization. I don't know when they became these mega places to buy people jets and stuff and such and, uh, you know, and, and dress real pretty. I don't know when that happened. See, when I talked about having a plan to address ego, that would be a good place of studying how ego has undermined the ability of even the church to be an effective organizing space so that people could profit and not the type of profit that's going to give you a prophecy that would allow you to get access, access to words of freedom from on high.